Okay, so once again, we're on the roof of the CSI, the Center for Social Innovation, on a foggy day with sirens going in the background because right behind me is a, a fire. We're starting to see the smoke from hopefully it won't spread in our direction. So thanks for joining me, Matt. No, no problem. Matt is the publisher of uh, Spacing Magazine. We're going to talk about that today and uh, your multimedia. You're also the website, blog, that kind of stuff. So I guess, uh, you know, the, the first question is, what is Spacing Magazine? What, what's it about? What do you want people to get from it? Well, uh, about five years ago, uh, about five and a half years ago now, in uh, late 2003, we launched Spacey Magazine, um, and it, it, it was centered. It is centered around um, issues regarding Toronto's public spaces um, and, and the urban landscape. So a lot of that is, you know, our sidewalks, our, our waterfront, our transit system, uh, cycling infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, and decisions that kind of come out of City Hall and and, and how they affect uh, uh, the built form and and, and how we uh, live in uh, public life in the city. So everyone was talking in silos, it seemed, in City Hall, just about transit, just about development. And we thought we would start this magazine in order to give like a, a wide umbrella um, so that all these issues could be talked about under uh, under one umbrella. Okay, that, so that's great for citizens that you're trying to break down those silos. But I, I get the sense that within City Hall, those silos exist whether or not the magazine exists. So how, uh, talk to me more about how you hope that the magazine breaking down those silos is actually going to have an impact on municipal government. Well, I, I think I, I, we've certainly seen a lot more um, interdepartmental, um, interagency uh, discussions that are going on a lot more now. Uh, for instance, the city is developing a walking strategy, and they're working with the TTC on making um, you know accessible bus stops and transit stops, uh, making sure that they're nicely designed and that there's urban design around these things. So there, uh, we've seen some sort of movements um, over the last couple of years where um, uh, at City Hall the departments are talking to one another and they're realizing that they were acting in silos and to the, to the benefit of everyone including the people that work at City Hall and the people that live in the city that they need these uh, need agencies to talk to one another so so I don't think we're responsible for that I think that's just been a culture change that's been happening at City Hall so it cultural change in City Hall because of Mayor Miller despite Mayor Miller what? Um, I think because of Mayor Miller, to, 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 to some extent, he's been there long enough that his policies uh, are, are felt throughout all the departments. Um, and uh, I, I think there's also lots of uh, influence from outside of City Hall, not just from uh, people like us, but from things like the Canadian Urban Institute, uh, from community organizations like People Plan Toronto, um, uh, and, and I think a, a number of residents' associations, um, and, and, and lots of uh, advocacy groups that are, that are doing stuff for, say, street needs, um, they're doing things for public housing, stuff like that. So you just mentioned the word advocacy. Do you consider Spacing Magazine an advocacy magazine? Um, a, a bit of it. Um, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not a, I'm not a we, we certainly started off that way. We. We, we've, we've veered more now to a little bit uh, a, a wider range and a wider kind of like perspective on on issues so that we, um, not just being advocacy but we can present m multiple ideas from different viewpoints and not always from I think you know we, we come from a, a rather progressive viewpoint I think in, in terms of city building um, but I think there there uh, how do I say this there's a good idea is a good idea. I don't care if it comes from the left, right, or the center. Um, I, I just want the city to be a, a great place to live. So you don't care where the ideas come from. So give me a sense of, say, the best three ideas you've heard in the last six months about Toronto. Uh, well, the one that came today, I guess I don't know if it's the best idea, but uh, was was funding from uh, streetcars. I think the federal government is going to uh, pay for our, our streetcar, our new streetcars that will be arriving in the next two years. So that that that's one thing that that's that's been great. Um, the second one is tower renewal. Um, it's a, a project to retrofit uh, the high-rise slab towers that exist all over uh, Toronto. Toronto has the second highest um, amount of um, high-rise buildings um, in North America outside of New York City. Um, and there were a majority of them were built in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, they're not energy efficient. They're, they're, we really need to fix those up. Um, that's been a project that was started by um, Graham Stewart um, out of uh, ERA Architects and has been developed um, into a policy by the mayor. And uh, it's, it's targeting priority neighborhoods in, in, in Toronto, 13 priority neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation as well is, is getting on board with it. Um, I guess maybe the, what would be the, what would be a, th a, a third one? Um, I, I, I would say the walking strategy, I guess. Um, combination of walking and, and bike 
uh, infrastructure priorities. It seems the city is getting its act together finally to start implementing and funding um, pedestrian infrastructure and cycling infrastructure. So the, the revised bike plan that's coming out um, uh, in the fall of 2009 and the walking strategy that the city has developed um, are really good things from an environmental perspective, from a quality of life perspective, from a health perspective. All these things I think will really improve uh, Toronto and, and I, I think those are really good things that the city is, is, is getting, wrapping its head around is actually start to implement. So let's come back to the magazine for a minute, because one of the questions I have, you know, as I look through the various things that you guys are doing, your podcast, your blog, the, the magazine, is in, in this day and age, why a magazine? Well, we started with the magazine before blogs were really getting going, um, and I also think the, the value of, of, of something physical is really, really important. Um, something that you can hold on to. We, we did a we, we do reader we've done a reader survey a couple of times to figure out to figure out you know things for our advertisers and whatnot. But one of the the great things that kind of came out of it was uh, we seventy five percent of our subscribers collect their copies. They keep them. They don't recycle them. Uh, they keep them or they pass it on to a friend. And and that's a very high rate for magazines. Um, so people actually want to refer to it. And I think our magazine too is is uh, we try to deal with issues that are are almost timeless in a sense. Like they're 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 going to be there for a while, um, you know, if we're talking about uh, cars or transit or water, um, these kind of themes that we, we've covered in the magazine, um, all of those are, 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 are going to affect Toronto, not just now, but, you know, well into the future. And so I think a lot of the topics that we talk about um, can stick around for a long time. And then with the blog, is we al that allows us to talk about things in the immediate sense, talk about decisions that are being made and announcements that are being made um, and events that are actually happening and transpiring. And, and we can cover those um, uh, in a really timely sense. So let's talk about the blog for a bit. Do you see that as a, a good example of uh, what's starting to spring up in a lot of places of hyper-local journalism? Yeah, I'm. Well, we're really excited about it because we have we have a, a Toronto blog. Um, obviously, the magazine's focused on Toronto, but we also have a Spacing Montreal blog, um, and we're really excited. I was just just. Just before we did this interview, I've been talking to some people in Ottawa, and it looks like in the fall we'll, we'll potentially have a Spacing Ottawa blog. Um, we, we've lined up some folks in Vancouver, so Spacing Vancouver is not very far away. And then one of our interns that's working for us right now is um, uh, goes to school in Halifax, um, during the, obviously during the school year, um, and is going back in and is uh, starting Spacing Atlantic, which is going to be based out of Halifax and St. John's, Newfoundland. And we have a number of people that are already uh, interested in talking uh, or writing for us and contributing for us on those blogs there. So what, what we're doing is we're creating a network where we can all feed into um, one another, learn from the good things that are, that are happening in Vancouver and Montreal and, and out east, um, and share those, share those ideas, um, and then realize that they're actually really similar and that obviously they're also unique to each lo location. But um, if, if we know the good things that are going on in terms of pedestrian policy in, say, say, say Halifax, um, Toronto can be informed from it, and I think our, our residents can be informed from it. The people that make policy um, understand these things are going on in other cities, um, but I don't think our reader uh, readers do and, and citizens do it nearly as much. And so, by creating kind of a national network of hyper local blogs, um, uh, we can be much more powerful in communicating these ideas of, of I think, uh, healthy, sustainable, and livable uh, city building. Well, cool. thank you very much, Matthew. Thanks sure. for talking to us.